new bounties, new emperors, new admiral, and one old ancient weapon. This chapter has just all of the things. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and this chapter is incredibly bittersweet because it's so damn good, but it has to sustain us for the next month. Meanwhile, Don Quixote Dolphamingo must sustain himself on your pats. Luckily for every person who hits this wonderful red subscribe button as a result of this video, our young dog Flamingo will receive one times pat. So be generous with your subscription and don't leave this good boy hanging. Okay, let's start with what I think is by far the most important event that has ever happened in my life, which is Buggy becoming an emperor. And uh, did, please don't tell my wife I said that. Although I think Grand Line Waifu would be pretty fine with it. In fact, my wife even drew this picture of Buggy for me once, so yeah, I think we're all good, maybe. <laughs> but how could I have any other response but to love this? I've made no less than this many videos proclaiming Buggy's phenomenal potential to be an emperor, because it just made so much sense. It's ridiculous enough to happen in One Piece, but it was also just viable enough to maintain not jumping the shark. From the perspective of your average One Piece world citizen dude, Buggy pretty much has everything going for him. He's a former member of the Roger Pirates, he led a mass breakout of Impel Down, he made an alliance with Whitebeard, Whitebeard at Marineford, where he also tanked attacks from all three admirals as well as Draco Mihawk, before finally being respected by the Shanks himself. All he needed was the right opportunity, the correct power vacuum to open up for his giant throbbing red nose to Phil. Quite know why I said throbbing there. That was weird, but I'm not re-recording it. And I'm not gonna lie, a lot of this wonderful news takes me back to the days where I was consistently told that Luffy, ah, oh, he wasn't ready to be an emperor because he didn't have the strength powers required. Well, I guess that argument has been put to rest forever. With that said, something big must have happened in tandem with this because Buggy and his forces on their own still probably didn't quite meet that emperor criteria. So I wonder if he's made a new alliance or something. Like perhaps a few of the remaining warlords have gathered under him and a situation that can only be described as somehow. And I guess I can see how he'd be able to slip through though. Assuming the world government know that Buggy isn't all that powerful on his own, I imagine that they would have sent the admirals after Hancock, Mihawk, and Weevil. Thus, I suppose making the attack on Buggy their weak point and just letting fate do its thing. I should also point out that we have a brand new image of every time two of the four emperors have clashed. Shanks versus Whitebeard, Big Mom versus Kaido, and of course, Luffy versus Buggy. The very first clash of emperors we bore witness to in all of the One Piece. Seeing our four new emperors together is also pretty amazing because Buggy, Luffy, and Blackbeard are all laughing in their bounty posters. Meanwhile, Shanks is the only serious one. So it kind of gives the impression that Shanks is just like, <sighs> I can't believe this shit. Oh, and also just a note on generational shift because that's one of the things it is I like to bring up. The previous generation has now all but disappeared because the current set of four emperors are all 40 years or younger. So just like Whitebeard falling in Marineford, Big Mom and Kaido falling here has led to our next big generational shift and I love that. I also absolutely love Bucky's new bounty image. It is so good. He looks so damn smug and to be perfectly honest, he absolutely deserves to be. This man has bluffed his way into becoming one of the former most legendary pirates in all of current existence, so he deserves all of the smugness. Plus his photo is kind of mimicking Luffy's, well, I suppose now old bounty image. You know, the one where he's holding the hand up and going, eh, I don't know why I made that noise. So I do wonder if Buggy is, uh, well, taking some inspiration from Luffy with that pose. But speaking of bounties, we didn't get everyone, but our worst generation captain trio have all been equitably updated, amassing a mighty three billion berries each. Now at first, I thought that number was kind of arbitrary. And in Luffy's case, maybe even even a bit low, especially considering his accomplishments here. But, 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 but then I realized something. Big Mom and Kaido were said to be the strongest pirate alliance ever formed. And when you combine their bounties, that number ends up being 8,999,100,000 berries. And then if we add up the worst generation captain trio, their value is 9 billion. So just over 1 million berries more than Big Mom and Kaido. So I think that was a pretty nice touch by Yoda there. And I'm wondering how much of that was planned. Plus I think that 3 billion each is actually pretty accurate to how events played out. I mean, yes, Luffy took a lot of the glory as he does in the glory hog, but the entire raid was a group effort. And I do like that we've evenly distributed at least the bounty numbers between our trio of captains here. I definitely wasn't expecting Luffy to have a new photo though. I don't know why, but I like it. However, five old dude men certainly do 
not like it because it reveals all of the things it is that they are trying to keep secret. And there's also a line in the chapter about removing the D from Luffy's name, which is eventually what they did with Roger as well. I mean, they didn't remove it, they kind of placed it elsewhere, but the same, same, same theory. But I'm just like, I've been sitting here telling you all to do that for years. As soon as you discovered there was another D in East Blue, you should have censored that entirely. Just what were you thinking? But we also have an appearance from Al, or at least my favorite man bird, Big News Morgans, who I am developing even more respect for as a true journalist. It's weird because he was introduced as this kind of sketchy mogul who gets to like pick and choose what the truth is. But as time goes on, Morgans is becoming like by far the biggest ally of truth as well as biggest ally of Luffy. And in retrospect, a lot of people have since drawn my attention to this video I made with a now kind of unintentionally spoiler filled thumbnail discussing what Luffy's true bounty should be. So this chapter is actually scarily paying off a whole assortment of weird predictions I've had over the years. One really interesting tiny thing that happened in this whole bounty section though, is that we cut to an unknown country featuring this massive mural of Sabo on the building. And it's not his current bounty photo either. It reminds me of how Boa Hancock unleashed that massive picture of Luffy on Amazon Lily, a tribute to her love. So I wonder what this Sabo picture is a tribute to because you don't just randomly hang giant portraits of people on buildings as, as a reason. So maybe he's the hero of this particular country. It does look quite war-torn. And I suppose Sabo could have done the revolutionary thing and liberated them and, and stuff like that. But perhaps it's a memorial image and Sabo has really died. Before getting into our super deep, huge revelation-y stuff, I want to talk about the Wano party because it had a lot of really nice moments. In particular, I love Jinbei waiting for the banquet just patiently sitting there going, mm, you know, which is very classic by the book Jinbei. Meanwhile, Yamato, Luffy, and Chopper made a wonderful trio of very excitable children. I really like that dynamic a lot. Something I enjoyed even more though was Brooke flexing his, I suppose, non-existent musical muscles performing a duet with Hiyori. And there was also a particularly sweet teeny tiny panel where we get to see Kinemon and Suru. And I love how Oda decided to draw this panel. Every other panel is flooded with detail, like characters, crowds, lights, drinks, noises, etc. But then when cutting to Kinemon and Suru, the background is completely blank and there are no other characters either. It's like in this moment they're sharing, they are the only two that exist in the world. And other sappy, romantic stuff like that. I do wish that we'd actually gotten to see the moment of reunion though. I think of all of the Wano characters, Kinemon deserves that emotional reward on screen. And logistically, it's, a, it's also kind of sad that Suru is now 20 years older than Kinemon. She's 55 and he's only 36. So all of a sudden, Kinemon has become quite the milf hunter. Now, something I did not predict, but a lot of other people smarter than me certainly did, was the revelation that Hitetsu is actually Kozuki Sukiyaki. I don't quite know who pioneered this idea, but it's been floating around for a long time because of the connection made between the interest in dolls. And it's an interesting twist that I'm not quite sure how to feel about. On the one hand, leaving Sukiyaki alive is probably one of the dumbest possible moves when your entire goal is to, to, to tell people that he's dead. Why not, why not just dead him? Dead him? What? <laughs> but on the other hand, this move was made by Archie, who is one of the dumbest possible people who happened to be in charge of making this decision. So I guess it checks out. And I feel bad for the guy, I really do. However, I feel that as the former Shogun and all, you probably could have done a little bit more than just sit and enjoy the festivities whilst everyone was fighting for the thing it is that you failed to stop. Alternative theory though, there may have been quite a bit of value in leaving Sukiyaki alive, particularly because in theory, he not only knows how to read poneglyphs, but also how to make them. So leaving him alive, turns out not such a dumb move after all. And of course, there just so happens to be a poneglyph in this room, but I believe it's the one that Brooke discovered in act two. So we're still waiting on that road poneglyph. However, that that's fine because we have a much bigger revelation here. A very sneaky Nika Robin has been holding on to some very key information ever since the end of Alabasta, as allegedly the ancient weapon Pluton is on Wano, which answers a very long standing debate we've had about whether or not Pluton was actually on Alabasta. No. It was not. And funnily enough, in retrospect, even if Crocodile did manage to beat Luffy, he still would not have been able to make his ambitions come true. Not being able to read the Poneglyph, he would have searched all over Alabasta to no avail. And even if he did manage to read it, well, damn, as it turns out, Pluton is sitting right under the crack of Kaido, a place that no one dares go. But it's kind of cool because it paints a picture where pre-time skip One Piece was all about discovering the locations of the ancient weapons and post-time skip is all about actually going to those locations. It does raise a couple of 
of questions, though. Like, how is it so well hidden that Kaido and his forces haven't found it in two decades of island management? Well, then much more interestingly, are we about to ride Pluton out of Wano? But the person whose reaction I'm looking forward to most is of course Frankie. He was the one who chose to erase the blueprints of Pluton from the world. So I'd be keen to discover how he feels about the world's most devastating warship being discovered or even being put to use. Meanwhile, after like half a decade, we have finally solved the mystery of what Ryukugyu looks like. And the answer is pretty much what we all expected, except a lot cooler and like significantly more shirtless. As predicted by Japanese film fanatics, his design is based on Yoshio Harada. <laughs> that is so hard to say. Harada. Crap. Harada. Yoshio Harada. As predicted by Japanese film fanatics, his design is based on Yoshio Harada, and his One Piece world name, Aramaki, comes from Ronin Guy, where Harada played a character by the same name. His design is pretty damn great though, seemingly a lot skinnier than the other admirals, but other than Sakazuki, this is probably the guy I'd least want to run into if I was a pirate, just judging by looks alone. His devil fruit is also becoming progressively more terrifying, because in the last chapter it was all like, oh, I can fly with my flower, and in this chapter it's more like, no, I'm gonna use my plants to suck the ever-crapping life out of you. And I mean, it potentially puts a whole new twisted spin on that whole not needing to eat food thing, because here we all are innocently assuming that it's photosynthesis, but really Ryukugyu could just be sucking the nutrients out of others. He's a scary dude guy for sure, and this chapter all but confirmed that no, he is not here for, for some kind of pleasant visit. In fact, it really is quite a stark contrast to how we first met him. He seemed like such an easy laid back kind of guy, man, but it seems like he falls more on the Sakazuki side of the justice spectrum, and he's here to start some shit. Although with that said, he is perhaps accidentally actually doing good things. Because if you look at the last panel of the chapter, you'll notice this trail of flowers and general greenery growing behind him. And in fact, I didn't even recognize Udon when we cut to it. That place was like the most desolate landscape of all of Wano and now it's this massive flourishing forest. I thought we were on Zo for a second, that's how lush it was. So maybe the way these powers work is that Ryukugyu sucks the nutrients out of his victims and uses it to plant new life around him. But whatever the case, Wano is already already recovering incredibly well due to Ryukugyu just being here. He also defeated King and Queen, a heavily injured King and Queen, but still. And I guess their fates are kind of up in the air now. Here's the thing, if Ryukugyu really does align with the Sakazuki side of justice, then he probably kills both King and Queen right here, because it's a quick and effective method of ensuring that they will never be a problem ever again. And Oda is on a bit of a bloodthirsty streak, so it is possible, although I hope not because I really like Queen. King, I can give or take King, but Ryukugyu is not messing around. And it would seem that a conflict with him is inevitable, which seems quite out of place for an arc epilogue. So my thoughts right now are that his intentions will be halted by someone or something, because I just don't think that we have the time for an all out fight against an admiral. I could be wrong. I mean, I'd love it if it happened. It just doesn't feel like the right timing for a fight of that scale. And sadly, we won't know for another four weeks, but in the meantime, I've got your One Piece addiction covered with this here video. So I look forward to seeing you there.